good morning, 9.30 service. Happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there. Uh, so the last couple of weeks, Quentin and I had a little back and forth uh, where, you know, I poked a little fun at his, his expense. And last week he poked a little fun at my expense. And his co-conspirator in that was my wife. And she doesn't know this, but no, actually, I'm just kidding. I don't have anything. I ain't touching that. That feud is over. We are done. There is no retribution. I love you, babe. Happy, happy Mother's Day <laughs> to you. Uh, you know, our mission and uh, as a church is people helping people grow generations of Christ-led influencers. We are in this together for the kingdom so that more people can know, love, and follow Jesus. And our, and our vision as a church is to unleash the church out into our community, out into our world with the love of Jesus to make an eternal difference in the lives of at-risk people. And people who find themselves at risk spiritually, physically, emotionally. We want to be a church that is mobilized to go out and to serve them. One of the things that, that we say around here is that our desire is not to be the best church in our community, but to be the best church for our community. And that drive is a whole lot different. You would, you would do different things if your desire is to be the best church in the community. But that's not it. We want to be the best church for our community. And one of the ways that we do that is through partnerships. We have uh, local partnerships with ministries and organizations doing good work. We have global partnerships uh, with missions and organizations doing good work. And man, I don't, cannot think of, a, of an organization in, in our community that is doing more to come alongside of families experiencing homelessness than new hope for, for families. And today I just wanna share a little bit about what is going on uh, with New Hope. And to do that, I've invited their director, Emily Pike, to come and join us. So would you please help me welcome Emily Pike up to the stage. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Sean. So the last time uh, you and I saw each other was at your gala, gala. How do you pronounce it? You Heart know, day, soft I day? say gala, okay. but that's because I'm not fancy like you, Sean. Oh, oh, is that what it is? It's fancy? <laughs> I think fancy people say gala, right? I thought fancy people said gala. So oh, well, maybe I'm the fancy maybe one. Maybe more fancy than no, you no, think. No. All right. So anyway, there were hundreds of people that were there. In fact, a lot of people I saw, you know, Tim Sherwood Oaks as well, and are pouring into your ministry or to your your um, organization. And, and there was a lot of money that was raised that night. But what was around the, the grand total? About $125,000. It was yeah, a really uh, spectacular that night. That's fantastic. And, uh, and your goal was 60000 Is that right? Uh, our goal for the night was a hundred. Was a hundred? So, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. well, then either way, you blew well. Absolutely. Well we were it. really, really pleased. That's great. So what would inspire people to give so generously to New Hope for Families? Tell us, tell us what you all do. Yeah, you know, honestly, I think it's the mission, Sean. I think, um, you know, New Hope is all about families. We're all about families impacted by homelessness and the way that we as a community can help them move through homelessness and into lasting stability. What are some of the ways that you come alongside of families to do that? Yeah, so we have two kind of essential core programs. The first is a family shelter. So we're the only shelter in our community that allows families to stay together and work through the crisis of homelessness together to get through to the other side. Because, I mean, it's a traumatic situation when a family finds themselves in homelessness. It, it is traumatic in so many different ways. But to have to be separated... Absolutely. Which oftentimes yeah, they are. Yeah, more than half the time in this country when families become homeless, they're separated either with women and children in one place and dad in another place or very often with children being removed to foster care unnecessarily. Which then just creates whole new levels of Absolutely. trauma and, and complications. Yeah, those families are homeless for longer and we know that when families are homeless for longer, those impacts on the kids are so much deeper. Yeah. Um, you know, we think about homelessness a lot in our community and it's in the paper, but we don't tend to think about the families. Uh, and the truth is on any given night, about 40% of people impacted by homelessness in this community in Monroe County are families with children. Man, 40%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we think about that, and even when we see you know, homelessness as we drive around or walk around town, Oftentimes we see single men, single women, mm -hmm. maybe sometimes couples, but we don't see families. That's right. You're saying 40% of homelessness yeah. in Bloomington are families. So where are these families going? 
Yeah, so that's the thing. They're, they're flying under the radar. And the reason they're flying under the radar is that it is considered child abuse or child neglect to be homeless with your kids, right? You're not able to meet their most basic needs. Uh, and so a lot of times when families become homeless, they don't want anyone to know. They want to keep it a secret because they're afraid that their children are going to be removed from their care. Now, the problem with that is that when we don't know that they have a problem, we can't help them. Yeah. But when there's a place like New Hope where they can come and be safe and not fear that their children are going to be removed unnecessarily, then all these other wonderful services and generous people in our community can come alongside them, just as you said, yeah. and help them figure out the next thing. That's great. So you provide housing, shelter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and then there's another pretty important Absolutely, service yeah. that you guys yeah. provide. <laughs> and then we provide early childhood care and education mm -hmm. to children impacted by homelessness. Mm -hmm. And that we think is super important. We know that uh, not having access to childcare is a leading cause of family homelessness. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that makes moving through homelessness take so long is not having access to high quality, affordable, reliable childcare, mm -hmm. yeah. which is what families really need, both for parents to get back to work work and for kids to be able to start school ready to succeed on their oh, first yeah. day. Yeah, that's great. So can you share with us a, a brief story just of maybe a, a life or a family that's been impacted by New Hope for Families? Absolutely. So I want to tell a story today about a dad called Roger. Uh, and Roger was a single dad and he, believe it or not, was living with his dad uh, and his, and his four-year-old son. Uh, and then his dad, uh, and they were making it, you know, dad had his uh, social security income and Roger was working and, and his little boy was able to stay with, with grandpa while he went to work, but then his dad had a stroke uh, and he had to move into assisted living. And Roger couldn't afford to pay the rent on his dad's house without his dad's income and they needed his dad's income to pay for the assisted living facility. Uh, and so all of a sudden, Roger didn't have a place to live and he didn't have any childcare. And his little guy was on the spectrum, and so he needed some extra support. Yeah. Um, and so he was really stuck. And I'll tell you, in most of the country, he wouldn't have had a choice but to find somewhere else for that little guy to stay while he worked through homelessness by himself. Um, we know that for kids with disabilities, that's so much more impactful. Uh, and so being able to, to welcome Roger into the shelter... Roger was on it. He got a job really quick. Well, he already had a job. He got more hours really quickly. Uh, he sent Jaden to our school and where he really thrived. And uh, we, we had the opportunity to just watch this family find the next thing for them. Uh, and I often think that's the part of it that, that I wish people understood more, is that I think we say things like, oh, that homeless guy. Uh, like homelessness is something that can define a person right? And it really isn't. Most people who become homeless are homeless one time for a brief period and never again. Um, and so we don't want our families to be defined by homelessness. Yeah. We want them to go on to choose the things that will define them, yeah. what they do and who they love and how they participate in our community. Yeah. Uh, Emily, that's great. And you guys are doing such a good job with that. I mean, I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing the story that you're going to share in the third service because that was different <laughs> than the first service. And so I get to hear all three of them. If you want to just find this part in the service online and, and you can hear the other stories. Uh, so one of the things that we have around here is called the Dollar Club Ministry. Mm -hmm. And we talk about it where uh, we, we give dollar bills and we pull those together. And typically we help families in our community with a hand up. Sometimes we come alongside of organizations like New Hope. And we have people that give faith faithfully, that $1 bill. And then we also have some folks that give checks with a lot of $1 bills all lumped in together. <laughs> the good kind <laughs> to, of tears. Yes, to yeah. go to the Dollar Club Ministry, which uh -huh. then allows us to be uh, extraordinary. Like we get to be generous with organizations like New Hope. Mm -hmm. And I know our Dollar Club funds came alongside of you all here recently. Uh, tell us some of what you're going to be able to, to do with that. Absolutely. Uh, I can't tell you how completely humbled we were by this gift um, we have been in the process for a couple of years now of building a new shelter uh, and a new school. Uh, the facilities that we've been in for the past 10 years are, are going to be repurposed very soon. And so we're just finishing up building a brand new school for 48 young children. That's a 200% increase over our current capacity. And in the background there, yep, there you go, that's the family shelter. Um, we'll open the doors on that in just about two weeks. Uh, and that will serve 12 families at a time, which is something we feel so, so pleased to be able to do. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do without community partners like, like all y'all. 
Yeah, Man, I just wanna praise God for the work that's been done on that because it's amazing. Uh, all of that, I mean, within the, the span, fundraising everything within the span of COVID and now the services <laughs> that you're providing, multiplying uh, for those families. So I know there's, a, there's an open house that's coming up uh, Saturday. We don't know if it's next Saturday or this Saturday. How will you define that? <laughs> uh, this Saturday, May 14th, uh, the next Saturday. That's right. Uh, yeah, at, from 1 to 4 p.m. And uh, so, yeah, people can come, tour the facilities, check it all out. Uh, how else can they find out more about New Hope? Yeah, so please come to the open house. It's a rare opportunity. We don't usually uh, welcome folks into the space where, where families are living, uh, but they won't be moved in yet. So this is a chance for you to see what you helped to build, uh, the shelter and, and the school both, uh, and we'll hope you'll come down and see it. If you'd like to learn more about New Hope or about the open house, you can go to New Hope, the number four, families.org. So New Hope for families.org. And you can learn a lot about who we are and what we do. Wonderful. Emily, thank you so much for thank joining you, us today. Really, really appreciate you. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I really do love the, the mission that New Hope has. And one of the things that I especially appreciate about it is you know, homelessness affects so much more and it takes more of a toll than just a physical toll. I mean, obviously it, it takes that, but there's also an immense emotional and mental, even spiritual toll um, that, that it can take on a person. And New Hope is looking for a way to come alongside and serve the whole person, not just alleviate and provide a solution to one part, but to really serve the whole person. In a lot of ways, that's what Jesus is doing in our text today. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app that you like to use, I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. It's in the, the sixth chapter of John's gospel where there's kind of a shift that begins to happen in Jesus' life and ministry and, and even his, his popularity. And up to this point, in Jesus' ministry, everything was trending like up and to the right. Like it was, it was all in the black. It was all good. More and more people were starting to follow him. Uh, there was this curiosity about who he was and what he was doing. And kind of this, you know, his mission of bringing the kingdom was starting to, to, be, to be realized. And, and, and then in chapter six, everything begins to, to change. Some who had been following Jesus begin to turn away because of some of what he begins to teach. And it got so bad that at the end of the chapter, Jesus looks at his 12 disciples and he's like, so are you going to leave me too? And the, kind of the, the, the pivotal point that, that made so many people throw up their hands and say, can't do this anymore, is our core verse for, for this week. John chapter 6 Verse 53, look at it with me. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I, I tell you, when I was looking at the preaching calendar a few weeks ago, I was like, oh. Oh, that's our Mother's Day passage? Why couldn't it have been like, for God so loved the world that he gave us one and only son? Like, I can make an easy Mother's Day tie-in right there. But, but Jesus saying, no, if you want any part of me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What in the world is he talking about? It's an odd thing for Jesus to say, isn't it? It's no wonder people are like, um, this is getting weird. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going to check out now. And on the surface, honestly, it is, it is a little strange. But listen, as I have uh, chewed on this verse, no pun intended. Okay, maybe just a little pun. <laughs> it's my dad joke on Mother's Day. You're welcome. <laughs> as, I've, as I have studied and reflected on, on this passage, it has, um, it has just encouraged my own soul so much. And I think that it has a whole lot to say to us, um, say to us today. 
So what's going on here? Uh, as always, context helps. At the beginning of chapter six, uh, there is this large crowd that begins to follow Jesus. They had heard about him. They had heard about his miracles. Some of them had even seen his miracles. And they're like, wow, who is this guy? We want to learn more. We want to find out more. And so they begin to, to leave their life behind and follow him. And so you have the 12 core disciples. And then, and then you have anywhere of up to a few thousand people that are just kind of lingering in the background, waiting and watching to see what Jesus is going to, to do next. And, and so one day they find themselves kind of in the middle of, of nowhere. They don't really have any food. It's getting dinner time. Everyone's getting hungry, uh, maybe even a little hangry. And, and so the disciples come to Jesus and they're like, hey, man, do you want us to go into town and grab dinner? It's going to take a lot of money, uh, but maybe we can raise some funds and, and pull that together. And and Jesus is like, nah, just go out and see what you can find. Maybe we can, you know, find enough to pull together for everyone to eat. And so they go out and they come back and they're like, yeah, bad news. Um, we have uh, like a little boy's lunch <laughs> that his mom packed him. Uh, and it's just like five pieces of bread and a couple of pieces of fish. And Jesus is like, that's all right. That's enough. And like there's 5,000 people here. How in the world? And they were doing math. Jesus was doing multiplication by himself. He, he knew the power of God. And he knew that that was going to be more than enough to feed everyone. In fact, it was. Jesus blessed it. Miracle occurred. And at the end of the day, they collected 12 basketfuls of leftovers to take with them. And so that night, everyone went to bed with a full stomach. And I don't think that we need to, to rush past that because this is a big deal. This is, this is a people and this is a time that would not necessarily know what it feels like to go to bed with a full stomach, to, to go to bed fully satisfied, not hungry, other than just maybe a couple of feasts in the year, they, they managed to, to just barely scrape by on what they had. And so everyone was familiar with those hunger pains that sometimes we feel at night when we lay down. But that night, that night, moms didn't have to decide which children would get more or less food based on which child got more or less food the day before. That night, dads didn't, didn't have to make the decision to give their portion to their family so that they could eat. Everyone went to bed that night fully satisfied. And they were wondering what kind of person can do what Jesus just did. And if he can do that, then my goodness, what else can he do? And so while they drifted off to sleep that night with visions of making Jesus their king and never being hungry again, never for want of anything again, Jesus and the disciples get up and they leave. They head over to Capernaum on the other side of the lake. And so when everyone woke up the next day, Jesus was nowhere to be found. And the thing about food is that no matter how much you have for dinner, what, you always wake up a little hungry. And so they're looking around going, where's Jesus? We're, we're ready for breakfast. <laughs> and they found him over on the other side of the lake as they were looking. And, and when they find him, this is what they say to him in verse 25. They say, Rabbi, when did you get here? And why didn't you let us know where we could find breakfast, man? <laughs> and Jesus knows their hearts. And he knows the question behind their question. And so he says to them, you're, you're not here because of the miracles that you've seen. You're not here because of all of these things that, that you have been witness to that, that show that I am the Messiah. You're not here because you are ready to surrender and follow me. You are here because you're looking for breakfast. And he, and he says to them in verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. You see, while the crowd is looking for more food, Jesus is looking for more faith. And he tells them that if they follow him, if they surrender and lay down everything and begin to follow him, that their souls will be as full and as satisfied as their stomachs were the night before. And in a lot of ways, this discussion that Jesus goes on and has with this crowd mirrors the conversation that he had with the woman at the well that Quentin talked about last week in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, Jesus offers this woman water so that she will never thirst again, living water that springs forth he wasn't talking about a physical thirst. 
He was talking about this deep thirst within her soul that was not satisfied by the wells in which she was digging from. That that was not satisfied by the relationships that she was in, the other places that she was looking for peace and for comfort. And I think in the same way Jesus goes on and he talks about the bread of heaven that comes from God and and that that comes to give life and to feed the world. And the people are thinking that he's still talking about breakfast. And so they're like, give us that to eat. We want that. We'll never bother you again. Just give us this bread that multiplies over and over and over, which isn't as crazy as it sounds when you just experience what they experienced the day before. And so they're like, yeah, give that to us and we'll go on our way. We'll be just fine. In verse 34, they say, always, sir, always give us this bread. We're tired of being hungry. We're tired of seeing our children suffer. And Jesus says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And it's an unsatisfying answer for those who were looking for a meal. But for those who are looking for more, for those who recognize the deep hunger in their soul that food cannot fill, it is the best news that they had ever heard. You see, in the crowd that day, you had a mixed bag of people. There were people who were physically hungry, who were only there to see what Jesus could do for them. But then there were also people in the crowd that day who were spiritually hungry, who, who were longing and thirsty and hungry for something more in this life and people who were truly seeking him and devoted to him, they were looking for more than just the things that food and water could provide. And Jesus knows that we are so much more than just physical beings. Yes, we are that, and he cares for those needs, but we are so much more than just physical beings. He knows that each of us has a hunger inside of our soul that the best meal cannot fill. He knows that you and your spouse can go to the nicest restaurant in Bloomington and it still won't fill that desire that you have for a greater level of intimacy with your spouse. He knows that having the best Mother Day dinner after church cannot heal the pain left by the empty chair at the table that your mom used to sit in the pain of not being with your child today. Cannot feel the pain of not being able to have children and the pain that this day especially brings you. There are some desires in us that just cannot be filled that easily. And Jesus says, I have come to satisfy every single, one of them to meet you in that pain, to meet you in that hunger and give you everything that you need. And it may not be what you expected, but it is exactly what you need. He says in verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Notice here that Jesus does not say that he provides this living bread. He says, I am this living bread. Because only Jesus can truly satisfy those deepest longings and voids and desires in our hearts. And you can try to fill them up with work and family and distractions and activities and achievements and goals. You can try to fill that void with all of those things and it will never satisfy you the way that Jesus can. It will never take away that spiritual hunger that you have. It can never provide the spiritual nourishment that your soul desires. Only Jesus can fill those true longings in your heart. And and we find that satisfaction when we consume and when we are consumed by Jesus. That's the point of our core verse for this week. 
when we find true life, eternal life, when, when we feed on his presence and his word, when we believe and we put our faith in Jesus, which is the central message of this text, belief is defined as a commitment to Jesus based on a trust in who he is. And there are some in this room that have had to wrestle with that in the darkness of your life to believe that Jesus is who he says that he is and only he can truly satisfy you and you've come through it to the other side believing wholeheartedly that he is. And Jesus is saying, listen, that feeling of satisfaction that you felt in your stomach last night, I want that to be what you feel in your soul all the time, but you have to follow me. And when faced with the reality of that, many people turned away. And Jesus starts talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And those who were only there for breakfast were like, we're out. In verse 60, he says, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then it goes on in verse 66 and says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Again, not the 12, but the crowd that had been around started to drift back, going home. And what I find interesting here. And in a couple of places like this, actually, what I find interesting is that Jesus doesn't chase after them. Jesus is like, oh, no, no, guys, you misunderstood me. <laughs> he doesn't try to explain himself. He doesn't, he doesn't try to soften or, or weaken the call to discipleship and what it means to follow him. When people realize that the dinner and the show is over and there won't be an encore, they leave and Jesus just lets them. But I imagine with a heart of compassion, he grieves for them knowing that they, as they go, they will never find what they are truly looking for because it can only be found in him. And, and while some walk away, others double down on their commitment to him. Jesus in, in verse 67 asks his, his disciples, the 12, you do not want to leave too, do you? And look at how Simon Peter answers. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, the Gospels reveal the depth of our need for a Savior and our inability to find what we need and what we desire on our own, to find what we need and what we desire apart from Jesus. The only thing that we bring to him is our hunger and then Jesus comes and he lavishes the rest of it on us and he fills our souls in only the way that we can. And when we walk and we live in faith in Jesus, he begins to satisfy our souls like no other and the spirit begins to bring life. And once you have tasted that, then you echo Peter's word, Lord, where are we gonna go? to find what we have found in you. But there are so many things in this world that are masquerading as living bread, and calling us, telling us, oh, if you want to find life, come and find it over here. And oftentimes we turn to these things looking to satisfy the desires in us and, and we come to the end of it only finding ourselves to be more hungry, more thirsty than we were before. I may have shared this before, and if so, I apologize, but um, this is for the new folks in the room. <laughs> um, there's an acronym that I found to be just incredibly helpful in my own life. I learned it several years ago now, and, and, and oftentimes when I'm kind of feeling just this emptiness or this void or something inside of me, I just bring it up to mind to make sure that I'm pursuing the right things in my life. And the, and the acronym is HALT. You may have seen it before. HALT stands for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. It's just kind of a self-evaluation tool. And so the questions behind this is, where do you turn when there's a physical hunger in you that may or may not be food? Where do you turn when there's a hunger in your soul for more? What do you run to? Where do you turn when you're angry, when you feel pain, when someone has hurt you, when you feel betrayed? Where do you go when you feel lonely or when no one else is around? 
Where do you turn when you are exhausted physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually tired? Where do you run when you feel hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Do you, do you veg out on your phone just mindlessly scrolling through Instagram, Facebook, insert your social channel of choice here, just trying to escape the pain, the thoughts? Do, do you binge on Netflix or alcohol trying to numb the pain? Do you run to pornography looking for an escape? And what we turn to in those moments often reveal the God that we worship, the little g God for sure, but the God that we worship. But these functional saviors can never satisfy us the way that Jesus does. In fact, they only leave us feeling more hungry, more thirsty, more angry, more lonely, more tired in the end. And Jesus is saying to us today, I am the living bread. I am the only one who can satisfy those deepest hungers and cravings and desires in your life. Only Jesus can meet the needs and fill the hunger that is deep within us. And so my question as we wrap up this morning is this, is Jesus sufficient for you? Is he enough? And we're going to enter into a time of communion when we bring those desires that we have and we allow him to fill us once more and we remember his body that was pierced for us and his blood that was shed. For, for those who have put their faith in Jesus, we invite you into this time of communion. You don't have to be a member of the church. If you have found and followed Jesus, we invite you to join us in this moment. And communion is a chance for us to reflect on our salvation, reflect on what Jesus did to, to purchase us on the cross, to, to forgive us and to set us free. And this morning, in light of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, I invite you to spend some time thinking about and maybe confessing today anything that you are turning to, looking to fill what only Jesus can fill to feed a hunger that only Jesus can fill and remind yourself that he is enough. And if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then I invite you to reflect on those things that you run to, those things that, that you have lifted up in your life to save you from the pain or the hurt or the anger or the loneliness and ask yourself, are they really delivering what you hope for? Are they really giving you the satisfaction that your soul so deeply desires? And if not, maybe today is the day that you turn to follow Jesus. Father, thank you for showing us the true way of life, for showing us the true way to find fulfillment in our souls. Jesus, you are the living bread. And when we feast on you and your word and your presence in us, Lord, our souls find a satisfaction that we could never find apart from you. Lord, thank you for saving us from those functional saviors that always leave us wanting more. And this morning, I pray that you will do that hard work of hard work in us. Draw us closer to you. Give us a hunger for you, Father lead us to more of you in our life. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this message from Sherwood Oaks Christian Church. Did you know you can view any message from the past six years at socc.org slash messages? You can also view complete worship services from the past month at socc.tv.